You asked for it, so here is part two. Seven good reasons to become a Buddhist. Hello there, sentient beings, and welcome to another Lion in the Sheepskin video. Now, you might wonder, why is my channel called that name? I will tell you in my next video. So you just have to wait and find out. Okay, but the short version of that story is it came from a really cool, inspiring like um, parable about a lion who thought he was a sheep. <laughs> and I thought it really illustrates a cultivator's journey towards self-realization. So I decided to use it as my channel's name. I know I said in my last video that I would do this one on karma, but I thought it's maybe too soon. There's still so, so much to talk about before we get to that. And because it's very complicated to explain and I didn't prepare anything. Now I want to give you all the amazing comments you guys left me from my last video and Wow, I have not expected so much positive response and constructive feedback. I mean, oh my gosh guys, I am so honored to have such a smart audience of viewers. And I cannot wait to answer them. But first, this is the part two of the reasons to be a Buddhist series, I guess? I've never planned for this to be a series, but due to this person from Reddit, it happened. So, Sangika from Reddit says, Not exactly my cup of tea, but good on you for spreading the Dhamma. Can't wait for seven good reasons to become a Buddhist. Yay! And there were just some people who were curious slash confused about some of the things or all of the things I said about the seven bad reasons to be a Buddhist. So I thought I should clarify myself and to look at some of the good reasons and good motivations to be a Buddhist because uh, that's only fair to balance out the skill. I will be interlacing each of these topics with some relevant comments I found uh, posted from you, the viewer. And you might also find that each of these seven reasons are directly related to the seven respective bad reasons. So now, on with the list. Number one, to understand our desires. So in my last video, I listed having fun as one of the bad reasons to become a Buddhist, right? And so I wanted to elaborate on that, how placing importance on entertainment value and mental mental stimulation can be detrimental to our cultivation. These so-called fun things that we do every day like playing video games or going to a party often coax out emotions or desires related to what we in Buddhism call the three poisons. They are greed, anger, and delusion. And they are every cultivator's worst enemy. It is important to understand why we should seek to understand them instead of letting them control our thoughts and our actions. However, it's important to note that we're not eliminating desires altogether. That would be pretty bad because we need desires to survive in this world, like eating, sleeping, socializing. We can instead 
also channel that desire to attain enlightenment. Number two is to seek everlasting peace and happiness. Now, if you recall, in my last video, the bad reason number two was to seek peace and happiness as the only goal. And I received a comment about it from Bob Joe. What the F are you saying? Buddhism is simply the end of suffering, thus peace and happiness. Peace and happiness is the goal. Buddha himself wanted to end or decrease the amount of suffering in the world. Well, first of all, thank you, Bob Joe, for pointing that out. And I apologize for not being clear. Perhaps a better term would be worldly peace and happiness. And by worldly happiness, I mean the feeling that you get when you had a nice long bath or even when you meditate. Well, you might ask, why can't I enjoy those nice feelings? Why can't I like what I feel when I meditate? Well, the answer is, of course you can. But for Buddhists and non-Buddhists, it is easy to be fixated on those feelings and mistaken them for the truth. So we see this a lot in pop culture, like this. Now, I don't have anything against Pharrell, and I think it's a great song. I love listening to it on the radio until I got sick of it. But I like to be happy too. I'm human. I like feelings of happiness. But happiness, unfortunately, is not the truth. But then, what is true? According to the Oxford Dictionary, truth or the truth means that which is in accordance with fact or reality. You are happy because of certain external conditions coming to fruition, like getting a car or getting married. But if those external conditions fall away, for example, your new car got totaled in an accident on the highway, or you're bickering with your partner about whose turn it is to do the dishes, your happiness becomes elusive. But how can something that's the truth be dependent upon external variables? Doesn't that change the definition of what's true? So instead of seeking elusive feelings of happiness, we can aim to find everlasting happiness, aka enlightenment, or that of realizing the nature of all things. I know you're thinking it, and yes, it is kind of like the Matrix. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. And no, it's not that hard. Just choose the right pill. Number three, to find authenticity in a world of superficiality. Last time I mentioned that you shouldn't be a Buddhist just because it is popular. And yes, I did realize that Oprah is not a Buddhist. Thank you for pointing that out. So the purpose of avoiding trends is to find authenticity. Everyone craves authenticity because we are surrounded by fake or manipulated images or stories in the media. Most, if not all, of our pop culture is built upon fiction. We obsess over movies, books, TV shows, games, even though we know that they are just made up from somebody's mind. So, at the end of the day, when the latest episode of Game of Thrones is over, 
we panic and we scribble to our phones or our computers or a game console so we don't have to face the real world. Most people can't handle their problems and their emotions, so they escape through fiction and the latest trends. Problems obviously won't disappear just because you turn the other cheek, and they only get bigger the more you try to ignore them. Then how do we find authenticity? The Buddha says, to seek it within yourself. Do not seek it without. At the end of the day, the choice is yours whether you want to face reality head on and become a better person or be these three monkeys to your problems. Four, to focus the mind. Sorry, I was filming during the daytime, but now it's nighttime, so uh, the lighting might look a little different. Last time, I talked about how people become Buddhists for the exotic traditions. And, you know, a lot of them are really cool looking. And that might be the initial reason, the initial appeal for you to get into Buddhism. And that's totally fine. But it becomes a slippery slope if one do not realize that the incense, chants, and robes are simply a reminder of what is truly the core of Buddhism mindfulness. So it's what's going on in your mind that's key. The rest are just superfluous decorations. Five, to study the Dharma and scriptures for its wisdom. So I received this Reddit post from Sound of One Hand. She makes some fine points, but some of these sound like great reasons to become a Buddhist. There's always initial draw to the Dharma, and it's usually wrong slash superficial in some way. But there's also something mysterious or profound about that encounter, and I don't think it should be looked down upon no matter how misguided. Yup, I think that's definitely true. Um, a lot of the reasons seem like great reasons to be a Buddhist initially, but I think one has to eventually take off the pretty outer wrappings and uncover the core of Buddhism in order to not be misguided. For the Dharma, or the reality of all things, there's two kinds of wisdom. One is the wisdom you gain from reading a sutra text or from listening to a lecture a Dharma lecture, and two, wisdom gained through experience. Both learning and action are necessary for the complete understanding of Dharma. For example, you learn about the term emptiness. It is a popular term in Buddhism. We can talk about it with our fellow practitioners, but what is it to us but another piece of knowledge? It's only when we take it for a test drive that these jewels of wisdom becomes truly valuable to us. The Buddha once said, however many holy words you read, however many you speak, what good will they do if you do not act upon them? Six, to have a better lifestyle and mentality. Instead of studying Buddhism for its philosophy, study it to have a better life. You've all heard of neuroplasticity, I assume. It's how our brain rewires and shapes itself according to our actions and thoughts, especially ones that occur often. We are used to doing things one way, and it usually gets us the same mediocre result. Yet, we continue to perpetuate our habits regardless because we think that one day the result will be different somehow, maybe better. But Buddhism 
teaches us and guides us in our actions and thoughts and explains that if you want to get a result B, you first have to do A. So for example, just the other day, there was an incident involving bread and it got me and my mom into an argument. The thing is though, I bought that loaf of bread a week ago and it's been sitting in the pantry so I didn't know why she's bringing it up now. So she said, why did you buy another loaf when you knew we had more bread at home? And I said, but you need different breads for different kind of food. Like, you can't eat a sandwich with a hamburger bun. And she said, yes you can, they're all bread, you just need to be less picky. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. You can and you will, because we're not going to waste food in this house. So that's what she said, and I really wanted to argue back, but I stopped and I remembered what the Buddha said. Attachment is the root of suffering. Okay, sure, I am suffering, so to say, but what is it that I'm attached to? Yeah, I suppose there are things that shouldn't be, like using sliced bread in place of hamburger buns. And there are things that are just the way it's meant to be, like using hamburger buns for hamburgers. But the problem now is that my mom just don't understand my point of view no matter how much I try to tell her. So I'm not happy, she's not happy, we're both not happy. But is it really her inacceptance of my opinion the cause of my unhappiness? Or is it because I associate her criticism of my bread buying with her criticism of me? I guess my strong belief in what I think is the right way prevented me from seeing things from her point of view. So just like how I had a belief about bread, she has a belief that food shouldn't be wasted in the house. Which is a valid point. So when I took myself out of the equation, I found that there's actually nothing to be angry about. This incident helped me see that there's more to gain by letting go and listening to the other party. So Buddhism taught me to see the, a different side to the problem, that the whole world doesn't revolve around you and your opinions and what you think is right. Other people's uh, views and opinions are valid as well. We all view reality differently. We all live in this little bubble. So if we can only step outside of our bubble uh, for a moment, we will see how you know silly and distorted our perception was to begin with. So Buddhism really guided me to use a different approach to problem solving, which is to use wisdom and compassion. Seven is to live according to the laws of karma. Okay, I did say that I will do karma in another video, so I will just be brief about this point. In the last video, I said it's not a good reason to be a Buddhist if you just want to blame all your problems on karma. To live according to karma is to understand the cause and effect. Where there is a action, there is a reaction. And it's just that. It's that scientific. It's not superstitious at all because when you bounce a ball, it bounces up. And the reason that the ball bounces is because of physics and gravity. So you can argue whether gravity is good or bad, but gravity is neither good or bad. We need it in order to survive. And without gravity, a lot of the things that we have in this world wouldn't work and we wouldn't be able to survive. We wouldn't be able to be grounded to the earth. 
So karma is just like that. It's neither good or bad. It's just a reaction to an action that preceded it before. So instead of seeing karma as a scary law that will punish you if you do something wrong, it helps you see the bigger picture that we are all connected to one another, uh, humans and non-humans alike. Whatever harm you cause onto other beings, the harm will come back to you. Kind of like that um, action and reaction. Um, whatever you do onto others uh, really boomerangs back to you because it's just a law of physics, kind of like Newton's law. And lastly, speaking of karma, it is the ultimate reason to become a Buddhist because like I said, karma is about cause and effect. And we are born. We were born, right? Uh, at least I hope you are. Um, we were born, so that is the cause. The effect is we all must die one day. And that is the cold hard truth of mortality of being a human. We all must face death one day. And that, if that's not a reason enough to become a Buddhist, I don't know what it is. The, the notion of death scares a lot of people because they don't know if there is an afterlife or what would happen if they die. So Buddhism, really helps you get through that fear by seeing that there is nothing to be afraid of because you had nothing to begin with. What is you? What is this identity you call you? Is it just your body? Is it just your brain? Is it your soul? If it's your soul and your consciousness, then what is your consciousness? Can you take it out and see it? What is your mind? Can you grasp it? So when you had nothing to begin with, when you came from nothing, before you were born, you were, you did not have this body. So if you think you had, you came from nothing, then when you die, you will go back to nothing. You just go back to wherever you came from, which is, you know, like going home. Uh, not a bad thought at all. So I really, really wanted to get to some of the YouTube comments and the uh, Reddit uh, comments that I thought was really interesting, but I think I might have to save it for the next video. But before I go, uh, I'd like to tell you about um, what I'd like to do next. So after much thought, I want to dedicate this channel to a Q&A only. So your comments will um, guide me, guide this channel uh, to whatever direction it will take. So uh, me and other uh, people will answer your questions and we will make videos based on whatever questions you have about Buddhism, about life, about relationship, um, you know, whatever you want to know. So you, my lovely viewer, gets to control the whole channel. Yes. If so it happens that there were no relevant questions asked, then I would start on this book called Be a Lamp Upon Yourself. Uh, link in the description below. It's a free uh, ebook about the basic fundamental knowledge of Buddhism and it does a really good job of simplifying Buddhism to its bare bones. And it doesn't um, it's not uh, of certain schools or sects, sects, S-E-C-T, and 
It's just a really great resource, especially for beginners. And we, we've、um, studied this in our Buddhist、uh, English sessions at our retreat center, and everyone really liked it. So I thought I'd do the video version of that book. Maybe a chapter for each video, and each chapter covers different、uh, Buddhist concepts. So please ask some questions. You don't want me to do videos on some book, right? It will just be like a video book club. Oh, I hope this goes well. So yes, please ask. Questions, lots and lots of questions. Nothing is too far-fetched or too unrelated because everything、uh, is related to Buddhism, and Buddhism is related to everything, you know, and so on. So I hope you took something from this video that was valuable, and I hope to see you again next time.